I wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking about postpartum health. And this is something that we really, we we obviously really focus on preconception health to then ensure you have a healthy postpartum period. So for me, I didn't focus on any of my, my, my preconception health. I didn't deal with a gut infection, didn't deal with the food sensitivity, didn't deal with any of the environmental toxins that, 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 that were, that were impacting my body. And I didn't deal with any of the, the mental emotional side of things. So my postpartum period was, um, I was irritable. I was anxious. I was not overly happy. And um, it was a difficult period of time. And I've since read about postpartum rage. I'm not sure if I completely had that, but um, there is a thing called postpartum rage. Today, I wanted to talk about postpartum health. I've got a um, expert talking about the fertility tracker, the AVA bracelet. And there's really, there's seven different factors that this bracelet will track, really focusing on your preconception health. So we're going to dig into that and how that can then impact your postpartum period. So definitely uh, you can grab your partner, um, sit down, listen to this episode. We're talking about the fertile window too. So dig into that and how a lot of couples are missing that fertile window and how these different, these seven different factors can actually help us, help us to pinpoint that. And, and so you could be doing all the right things, but if you're missing the, the window, it's not going to work. Excited for you to listen to this episode and feel free to leave a review on iTunes. Hey there, I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone. We only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the Supercharger Fertility Discovery Call is for action takers, and really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. You're not a machine. You're different every month. So based on what we saw that was happening inside of your body last night, this is, you know, now we're going to say actually you're fertile window looks like it's a day earlier because we see these signs that it's opening or it's a little later. There's this interesting study that says 70% of women, their fertile window does not fall entirely within the parameters the textbook average cycle should. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Clark, and my mission is to inspire, motivate, and empower you. And most of all, I want you to wake up. So with functional medicine, we can discover what causes infertility and eventually reverse the condition. Today, I'm welcoming Lindsay Mizell to the podcast, and we're digging into postpartum health and how to optimize this prior to conception. Lindsay Mizell is the chief science editor at AVA Fertility Tracker. She's an expert at breaking down science, technology, and health as it relates to women's health and the menstrual cycle. With over a decade of experience educating and writing about re- reproductive health, Lindsay is a sought-after speaker and presenter. Her work has been featured in The Fertility Hour, The Birth Hour, The Breakthrough Journal, and The Rumpus. You can check out her website at Ava Women, so avawomen.com. And before we jump into today's show, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this to make sure you never miss an episode. Hey, Lindsay, excited to have you on the podcast. Hi, Sarah. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, awesome. So if you could share your journey and really how you came to this field of work. Yeah, definitely. So um, I became interested in menstrual cycle tracking and fertility um, through my own personal story, which is I, throughout my whole 20s, was a runner and I was just really, I thought I was really healthy and active and I loved, like, my whole community was my running community. I liked doing races and half marathons and things like that. I was on the hormonal birth control pill for a long time. Um, I eventually uh, switched to the copper IUD, so non-hormonal IUD, and I did not get my period. And I went to a couple of different doctors and um, they were like, well, you know, this is kind of common with runners, but it's not a big deal. You're not trying to get pregnant right now. Like, you know, don't, don't make any big lifestyle changes. If you want to get your period, you can just go back on the hormonal birth control pill. Um, so that felt like a really weird thing to say because obviously on the hormonal pill, that's not a real period. Mm -hmm. Um, I eventually just through my own research learned that I had something called hypothalamic amenorrhea. Mm -hmm. And that's where if you, um, if you're not taking in enough calories for your activity level, your, your body actually makes a really smart decision that it's not a good time to get pregnant and it shuts down your menstrual cycle. And that's really bad for fertility, obviously, but it also has all kinds of bad long-term effects on your bone health, heart health, brain health. It's just not a good thing. I felt very angry that no doctors told me this. 
Um, and so I stopped exercising temporarily and I ate a lot more food and I gained some weight and I got my period back. That kind of just made me really passionate about this topic of, you know, I, I felt like, why isn't this taught in school? Why don't doctors know this, that your menstrual cycle is important? The cycle you get on the pill isn't real. It's important for fertility. It's important for overall health. And so that led to me, that led me to where I am now um, as the chief science editor at AVA. You know, AVA is a women's health research and technology company. My, my, also our product is the AVA bracelet, which tracks the menstrual cycle and tells you when you're fertile. My role there is I run AVA World, which is an educational platform for women's health. And so it's really great to try and fill in the gap of education around the menstrual cycle and why that's so important. Um, and I also use the Ava bracelet in my own pregnancy journey. I got pregnant using it and my son is now 16 months old. Oh, wow. Nice. Nice. Well, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, I love the name of the company because that's the name of my daughter, Ava. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, just kind of circling back there on your journey. So on the, the HA diagnosis, we actually had um, Dr. Nicola Rinaldi on the podcast. Oh, I know her. I, she's wonderful. She's yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. So definitely for the listeners, just um, you can go back to that episode and she talks all about strategies if you're dealing with an <laughs> HA diagnosis. And also we had uh, Dr. Jolene Brighton on talking about uh, Beyond the Pill and talking all about the, the all the effects of the birth control pill. And a lot of times people, everyone that I speak to, a lot of people that I speak to and myself, it's when you have these irregular cycles and things that are going on, the first acne, other issues, first thing is to give the pill and wait a minute, that's a band-aid approach like you were saying and get to the bottom of why. So her episode with uh, with Dr. Jolene Brighton is a good one to listen to as well. And also another one that you mentioned, the period being that vital sign. And Lisa, I don't know why I'm pumping all these episodes now, but just everything you mentioned, <laughs> I wrote it all down. Um, Lisa Hendrickson Jack, and she is the author of The Fifth Vital Sign, talking about our cycle, like really looking at that because it's a huge barometer of our health. So um, yeah, thanks for, for, for taking us through there. And uh, yeah, so let's, so t today we're going to dig into really looking at postpartum health. A lot of times when we're going through infertility, especially if we've, we've gone um, straight to the fertility clinic and didn't really dig into why we're having issues with our cycle or why we're having a hard time conceiving, our postpartum health may be affected. And this was the case for me. I was diagnosed with premature ovarian failure. I had both my kids with donor eggs. And then in my postpartum health, I didn't have like postpartum depression. I, and I didn't even know what this was, but I had postpartum rage, which is a thing. And I was just freaking- I never knew that was a thing. Whoa. I was like freaking cranky. I, was, I wasn't like going like hysterical or losing my mind or anything, but I, I was just a cranky pain in the butt. And I look back and there is a thing called postpartum rage where, yeah, like your hormones are all over the place and your mood is like, I just thought I was a cranky person, but, but no, there's other things going on with my health. So today for the, and, and being able to take care of a young baby. And so this is really important. So I wanted to dig into, so how does tracking your cycle help to then ensure a healthy postpartum period? I mean, I think the, the first thing is that most likely you won't have a cycle immediately postpartum, but it's still, it's still really important, I think, to learn how to do this if possible before you get pregnant because it puts you a lot more close in touch with what's normal for you. And also just this, this idea of learning how to read your body's signals. And I think having a practice of that that's established before you get pregnant, or even if you establish it after in the postpartum period, it helps you advocate for yourself better and speak up if something seems off. I, I also think there's a lot to be said for learning this while you're like before you have a baby, because it's, there's a learning curve to learning how to track your cycle. It's, it's, just, it's just harder to do all the things you need to do when you're waking up in the middle of the night and and taking care of another human. Um, so just the benefit of that, of, of already knowing how to do it is you can get back into it more quickly if you want to have another child and you don't, um, you know, I, I hear stories all the time of women who had to use fertility treatment for their first and sometimes get pregnant naturally for the second. Mm -hmm. um, so it can, it can help you understand what's going on with your fertility and even catch when your fertility returns for the first time postpartum. Yeah. And so how would we go about tracking our cycle? I think a lot of times we're, we're using apps for potentially, or we are tracking it with other ways, maybe just with a piece of paper, but like how, how, how do we go about tracking our cycle? Yeah. So um, this is my favorite topic ever. So I'm a really big proponent of tracking cervical mucus. If you want to go the um, mm. you know, like most natural route there's been actually, so cervical mucus, I think there's this idea that it's, you know, it's this kind of like 
sign, this, this kind of vague sign that your body gives, and it's not that accurate or reliable, and you can't really trust it. But there's actually been a few studies that say um, cervical mucus is a highly accurate way to track your fertility. And you know, you hear a lot about the, the best days to get pregnant, like, oh, is it the day before ovulation? Is it two days before? There's a lot of debate about like, you know, different studies find slightly different things. But there was this other study that said, actually, no, it kind of depends on the woman. And really the best day to get pregnant is when you have the most cervical mucus, because that what that is what determines fertility and that's what helps sperm survive. So I think I think everyone should know how to track their cervical mucus. It's just it's when I learned what makes cervical mucus change to become more fertile, it's directly cha- um, d- impacted by your changing estrogen levels. And so cervical mucus really is a key to knowing exactly what's going on with your estrogen levels. And I think it's a really valuable sign to track. Then there's the temperature method, of course. Um, I think the temperature method is gives you a lot of really cool, useful information, but it's hard to do in practice. You have to take your temperature pretty consistently at the same time of day before you get out of bed. And you have to, you know, if you are sick or if you have been drinking or anything, like there's a lot of things that can just throw it off um, and it's hard to do consistently, but it does give you a really clear sign that you ovulated if your temperature rises. I think there are some cases where your temperature would rise and you didn't ovulate, but that's very rare. So it's nice to have that information. You know, it also doesn't tell you, that doesn't help you get pregnant if that's your goal, because by the time you see that pattern, it's too late. There's lots of different devices now, Ava included, that help you get that data without having to do the work. That, you know, that's a, that's a nice thing because that's the biggest downside of that is that it's like women do enough work when it comes to their fertility already and having to like take your temperature every morning is just, I think, too much. Then there's ovulation predictor kits. And I always have to say, my, my, I think like everyone is using these wrong. So ovulation predictor kits, the LH tests tell you, usually they tell you, they give you like 24 to 36 hour warning of ovulation. It really depends on the woman. Um, I think the biggest misconception around these is that I see women waiting to have sex until they get a positive result. Because I know with infertility, oftentimes you're not having sex, you know, like every other day throughout the month because you've been trying for so long and it's really hard. And so you're saving it for when you get that positive test. But for a lot of women, your most fertile days are before the test even turns positive. And so I think relying too much on LH tests can really hurt your chances. I think the best way to use LH tests is as like a secondary sign after cervical mucus, like look to your cervical mucus, start having sex when you see fertile cervical mucus. And when, um, and and that's when you kind of know when to start using the ovulation tests is after you've seen the fertile cervical mucus. And then of course there's the Ava bracelet, which I have to talk about Mm because I I work there and I love it. Um, so Ava is, um, it's a sensor bracelet. You wear it at night. Uh, it tracks seven different physiological parameters. And these parameters correlated with the changing levels of progesterone and estrogen during your menstrual cycle. And the really cool thing about Ava is that, so temperature tells you, tell, it's this very clear sign and it changes in a really drastic way in your cycle, but it doesn't tell you when you're fertile. It only confirms it after the fact. And so when you know the founders of Ava set out to create this, they thought, well, you know, th- there's been so many advances in sensor technology in recent years. How could temperature be the only thing that changes? Maybe if we measure you know, everything else that technology allows us to measure, we'll find something else that changes earlier. And so that was our original clinical study that we did. And we found that several other parameters change in a significant and measurable way throughout the menstrual cycle. One of the strongest signals is resting pulse rate, um, but breathing rate, HRV, other parameters also change. And so our algorithm works by, you know, when you're, when you're sleeping, um, all of your, all of these parameters go to their baseline levels. They're not impacted by your daily activities. They're just impacted by what's going on in your cycle. And um, our machine learning algorithm is able to take that information when you sink in the morning and make a real time prediction of where you are and um, detect the beginning of your fertile window. And so I'm a big fan of that method as well. Yeah. And just back to the cervical mucus, because it, it can take a couple cycles to figure that out. I think a lot of people, yeah, they get stuck with the ovulation predictor kits and not getting the right information and then haven't even, you know, looked for their, for their cervical mucus and it can it can be a little confusing, I guess. It definitely can. And I think another thing that's confusing about cervical mucus is that you, you sometimes hear stories of like, you know, some, for some women, cervical mucus is something that you don't even have to look for. It's like there in your underwear. When you wipe, it's just like very obvious. And for other women, you have to like, like put a finger up to your cervix and like 
poke around and see what you find. Mm -hmm. And I think in that latter scenario, it can be really stressful because you're thinking like, oh, is that like, you know, maybe if you can find it when you look for it, you're like, but is it bad if I don't make so much of it? And um, so, yeah, if, I think depending on what, how much cervical mucus you make, it can be harder or easier to learn. Um, but you can definitely get pregnant if, you know, you don't make tons and tons of cervical mucus as long as it's there and you see it. And if you're ovulating, there's a good chance that you're making enough cervical mucus to get pregnant because in order to ovulate, you need your estrogen levels to get above a certain threshold. And necessarily, you know, when your estrogen levels are that high, you are making some cervical mucus and being having cervical mucus at the cervix is where it really counts. So I do have a blog on this. If you can check out, you can go to Fab Fertile, F-A-B Fertile, and it goes through the steps on how to find, how to, to, to look for your cerv cervical mucus. So you can check that out. It was actually a blog I did with um, uh, Lisa Henderson-Jack. So she's a fertility awareness educator and really an expert on, on, on this. Okay. And so just going into, you talked about a number of these different steps or are stages that, that Ava bracelet will, will look at. So let's go into the heart rate variability. And so how does that, what is that exactly is that? And how does that track our stress levels? Um, I love talking about this one because I think stress is so important. So heart rate variability is, is the variation in the interval of time between each of your heartbeats. And I found this kind of surprising, sort of counterintuitive, but the more variation, the better. And so you want your HRV to be high. When, when your heartbeat is, um, when the variation between your beats is very low and when, when it's very an even interval and kind of like a metronome, that's a sign of higher physiological stress. When there's more variation, that indicates resilience to stress. You can see in your AVA data when you sync every day, oh, your HRV is high, you have all this variation in the heartbeats and that's good. Or you can see it's low and maybe that's a sign that there's more stress in your life. And the nice thing about this is that I, I learned really well in my own journey with HA that Stress isn't always something that you can perceive directly. Physiological stress is really different than emotional stress or stress that is just very apparent and on the surface. Um, people with HA often say, oh, exercise is such a great stress reliever. I very much did that. Um, and it, it does feel like it is, but it's also a form of stress. It's a form of physiological stress. And that's the kind of thing that you might be able to you know, observe your own patterns by looking at your HRV data. Yeah, I use the uh, the heart math. The little they have a, a Bluetooth one that I that I use to that looks at the heart rate variability. And I know so also I know Aura Ring has um, a tracker too that they, that looks at the heart rate variability. There yeah, yeah. Other other me uh, metrics as well, but I haven't um, used the Aura Ring, or I don't even know that much about it. But I know that um, that I, I listened to some other health podcasts where they're like super into the Aura Ring for sleep mm -hmm. tracking and HRV, and yeah, you can really nerd out about all that stuff. Oh yeah, people have gone crazy about that. Okay, yeah. so basically. Basically, yeah, and so we and we we talk about the other different stress levels. So it's like a stressor on the body it could be a food sensitivity, a gut infection, uh, the environmental toxins, uh, mental emotional stress. So something out of alignment. So it's not necessarily just the mental emotional side of things. Other uh, other things, as you were saying. So for you, it was the exercise, and even though you loved it, it was it was not not um, beneficial for for, uh, for your body. So pulling back on those things. Yep, exactly. Okay, so as far as looking at sleep variations at the different stages of our cycle, so how can that impact our postpartum uh, period? What would that look like? Yeah, so the, the big hormone that's important here is progesterone. Progesterone has sedative qualities. Um, progesterone is higher in the luteal phase or the premenstrual phase of your cycle. And so some women can experience you know, sleeping better, longer, feeling more tired, in general, in that phase of their cycle, there's tons of variation because sleep is impacted by so many different things, and the menstrual cycle isn't the only one. And you know, progesterone might also make you more crampy, or you feel bloated, which can keep you up. Or there might be something totally unrelated to your hormones that's keeping, you know, that's impacting your sleep. That's kind of that's what you would expect from just looking at the menstrual cycle in a vacuum. But that's not the only factor. Um, then the other thing is that in the postpartum period. I think that the, actually the variations in hormones in your menstrual cycle um, are probably the least important factor in, uh, in your sleep at that time. Um, there's, there is a major decline in both estrogen and progesterone postpartum, and that could definitely negatively impact sleep. Um, there's also changes in melatonin in the first three months, and that can have an impact on your circadian rhythms. But by far, the biggest impact to sleep in the postpartum period isn't hormonal or related to your menstrual cycle. It's your newborn's sleep and feeding pattern, um, which you know is very not conducive to sleep. 
Um, I've also heard, I don't know the research around this, um, but I've heard that women are just more likely to have lighter and lower quality sleep for the first one to two years postpartum. I, my experience was that eventually my baby started sleeping through the night, but I no longer was able to, um, and <laughs> which was extremely depressing. <laughs> And I, I think um, it could be that we're just, kind of, as women, we're kind of evolutionarily programmed to, uh, you know, be more alert and not be able to settle down and rest as well at night, or it could be related to breastfeeding hormones. But you know, who knows? It, it, this also matched what I saw in my AVA data that, um, you know, for I think my first year postpartum, I had less total sleep and less deep sleep. I'll also say this is unrelated to cycle tracking or AVA or anything. But I, um, I actually ended up having terrible insomnia that started around the time my baby started sleeping through the night. I ended up doing cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy for insomnia. There's a specific CBT, for insomnia, it's called CBTI, um, and it was highly effective. There's tons of research behind it. Um, my sleep is great now. So if anyone is out there struggling with insomnia, postpartum or not, check out CBTI. It's wonderful. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for that. And then if, if we were just to look at our cycle in general with our sleep, is there anything you can say for each, each cycle, each stage then kind of, can we dig into that a little bit more, um, our actual cycle of what we would see? Yeah. I mean, I'm careful here because I think yeah, there's, I mean, there, other factors. I there's so many other like sleep is just like such a complex phenomenon yes. and there's so many different things that affect it. So I think there, it is true that progesterone is, has sedative qualities and that can impact your sleep. But I think in a real world environment, everybody just is impacted by so many other things. So I think it'd be unlikely that, that every single woman would see the same pattern. And so, yeah, so we work with, with uh, couples on sleep hygiene for months in our, our program um, and, you know, making sure there's a dark room and making sure you know, not doing the, the the blue light blockers and all that before bed. If we were on, like on the AVA tracker, what would it tell us, for instance? Yeah, so, the, so AVA tells you your sleep duration and your sleep phases. And so there's, um, you know, when, when, you, when you're sleeping, you're going through these roughly 90 minute cycles several times throughout the night. And they include light sleep, deep sleep and REM sleep. And you actually wake up briefly between each of these cycles. And unless you're going through an insomnia experience, you don't remember these wake ups. When, when you have insomnia, you do remember them because your brain kind of says, oh, I'm awake. Oh, shit, I'm awake again. Like, that's bad. That means I have insomnia. But um, it's actually really normal to wake up you know, several times throughout the night in between these sleep cycles. But um, what Ava shows you is the, the, so the total number of hours that you slept and the amount of time you spent in in light and REM sleep and deep sleep. And so you can, you can see these patterns over time and how they change. And if there is something that if, if you are experiencing a cyclical pattern in your sleep related to your menstrual cycle, you would easily be able to track that in your ADA data. Okay. And then as far as, so postpartum depression, I was talking about postpartum rage, but we'll talk about postpartum depression. Um, so how is focusing on your health prior to conception? How, how is that helpful? Yeah, I mean, I think well, postpartum is the time in your life when you're probably less focused on your health than ever before, um, and you're also more vulnerable health-wise than you ever have been before. And so, I think that if you're not focused on your health prior to conception, it's going to be really, really hard to prioritize your, yourself and your emotional health after um, in the postpartum period. Um, so, so really, that's the most important important reason to to do so. I think it's just it's almost this um, emotional idea of you're important, you're valuable, and if you if you, if you prioritize yourself and get in the habit of that before, you're more likely to you know notice what's going on with you and care about that after. I, I think postpartum depression is still really poorly understood. The fact that you know you had postpartum rage, and I'm someone who works in women's health, and this is my whole livelihood, and I've never heard of that, shows how you know poorly understood and like under publicized a lot of this stuff is. I know there's also postpartum anxiety that doesn't get a lot of attention. And I think really there just has not been enough research in this area to be able to say conclusively what are the causes. We know some of the risk factors, what are what are the, um, the best ways to treat it. And there's a lot of interesting research around could there be, um, you know, nutrient deficiencies or um, different hormonal imbalances. And there's that, that's all interesting and promising, but I think Really, at the end of the day, we, it's just unfortunate that this hasn't been prioritized more in research. I also want to, um, we, we can talk about that more if you want, but I wanted to take this opportunity to mention um, DMAR. Do you know about this? Dysphoric milk ejection reflux? Okay, so this was like the most surprising thing to happen to me postpartum. I was breastfeeding and I noticed that when I started at the beginning of every breastfeeding session, 
I felt fleeting, like maybe a 30 to 90 second, extremely bad feeling. If, if you've read Harry Potter, they talk about the Dementors. I think that's what they're called. It's been a while since I read it, but they just like make everything feel like utter gloom and despair. And that's the experience that I had for just like a minute at the beginning of breastfeeding. And I was like, that's really weird and whatever. And then I somehow happened upon that's a real thing. It's called dysphoric milk ejection reflex. It's also like a lot of things in women's health, very poorly understood, but they're it's it's related to um, the when you when there's a rise in prolactin that also causes a drop in dopamine and some women just during the letdown period of breastfeeding have a, a, an odd and unusual reaction to that that causes these really intense negative feelings um, and then it just goes away as soon as the letdown is done. I want to do what I can to publicize this because I was extremely dismayed and confused by it and I'd never heard of it before and it's I, I think the confusing thing about it is that. It's, it's, it's a reflex. It's like when the doctor hits your knee, um, in, you know, at the, in the doctor's office and your knee kicks, it's, it's not, um, it's different than depression in that it's just this, this thing that happens to you and you have no control over and then it's gone in like 10 seconds. No, that's interesting. Cause it's, I know, cause we think of when the, when the breastfeeding is supposed to be this loving, beautiful thing. And for some people, obviously there's a struggle with it. And then if dealing with that is like, wait a minute, I'm sure that was, that was very difficult. Oh yeah. I, th- I think breastfeeding is like, it's nice, but it's also like the worst thing in the world and torturous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I but I guess it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then sort of some underlying causes and we work with a lot of this in the preconception health period of looking at people's, looking at thyroid and we don't diagnose, it's more to educate, but to uh, looking at full thyroid panel. So if there's a thyroid issue that then could get worse, if you haven't addressed that, you know, the preconception period. So and a lot of people that come to us have um, um, hypothyroidism or undiagnosed Hashimoto's so really looking at a full thyroid panel. This is what we do in our, our blood chemistry review and those nutrient deficiencies too. And as again, a lot of people that we work with, um, they were on long-term hormonal birth control like yourself, like, like me and that band-aid solution. And then that impacts your, 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 your nutrient levels. So you can eat this beautiful, healthy diet if your body's not absorbing it then also predisposing you to those food sensitivities and gut infections. So digging into this piece of your health, um, as you say, looking at your health before your, your, you have your child or expand your family even more to really focus on yourself because it gets, it gets difficult to be able to prioritize yourself once the little baby is here. Yeah. And, and one more thing I want to say about postpartum depression. I think that, I think if, if you have, postpartum depression is a real medical condition, it's hormonal and there's treatments for it and women who have that should get it. My experience postpartum was, you know, when I was filling out those questionnaires, when I was just like, people asked me how I was feeling. I, I wasn't a hundred percent sure I didn't have postpartum depression at the time. I definitely didn't, but I was like, I feel the worst I've ever felt in my life. Like this is, this is really unhappy. And I think I wish there was also more room to talk about how much the postpartum period for a lot of women just sucks and it's awful and, and, uh, you know, not this like wonderful, joyful time. And I think that's really hard for women who've gone through infertility because it's this thing that you've, you know, tried so hard to get and struggled for so long. And then you're like, Oh, I feel ungrateful, but this is really horrible. It's really awful. And I think that's just, that's normal for so many women. Um, and it goes away. And I think, you know, part of it is probably that our societies aren't set up to make it easy to get the help you need. Like, never have I been more we're not meant to be these like individual family units, just like man and woman doing things on our own as in the postpartum period. It's like, this is just ridiculous. Like this can't be the way it's meant to be. <laughs> like somebody please help me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting, right? Yeah. But it takes a village and to do this by yourself and to really reach out for support. And it's, it's hard when everyone seems to have all their shit together and it's like, uh, no, they don't. And, and really to reach out to people. And I think it's, we, uh, the conversation is opening up you know, it's, it's, it's opening up more now, but it's still when you're going through that and you think you're supposed to be able to, you know, to handle everything yourself. Well, no, it's difficult. Yeah. And okay. So back to the Ava tracker. So on, another one we look at is the resting pulse rate. So why is that important? And what is Ava a tracker looking at? Look at that. Yes. This one's very important. So resting pulse rate changes throughout your menstrual cycle, just like temperature changes. But the nice thing about resting pulse rate is that it changes um, most likely in response to estrogen. Um, it changes earlier than temperature does. So in your menstrual cycle, around five or so days before you ovulate, estrogen levels start to increase. And that's the beginning of your fertile window. And estrogen increases significantly around that same time. Um, I think 
I'm trying to remember, I think in our study we found that your, um, your resting pulse rate increases around average two beats per minute um, at the, like during your fertile window. And then it increases again after ovulation. And so our study was actually agnostic about figuring out the cause. We presume that the, that initial increase is from estrogen and afterwards it could be you know, from progesterone or something else, but th that is what we observed is that estrogen changes in this, in this predictable way in, you know, in many women during the menstrual cycle that is conveniently allows us to, it's one of the factors we use in predicting the fertile window. I don't know. I think the main thing about this is that it's, I, I, it makes me a little angry that it took, you know, until just the past like several years for this to be more commonly understood. And, you know, Ava as a, as a private company is, is the one doing the research on this. Um, there had been a few studies before us where they had women come into a lab at different days of their menstrual cycle and just kind of manually take their resting pulse rate. And then it, you know, it had been observed that, yeah, pulse rate is doing something in the menstrual cycle, but what we can do when we're monitoring continuously on women throughout the entire night, every single day of their menstrual cycle is a lot more granular and can tell us a lot more. And I think this is the kind of thing that should be you know, taught in schools, OBGYNs and in textbooks and sex ed. And I, I want there to be a lot more recognition that you know, temperature isn't the only thing that changes in the menstrual cycle. Pulse rate's a really big one. And it's also, there's other things besides pulse rate. There's a breathing rate that changes, um, perfusion and lots of other physiological parameters. And so just to take us through, so someone was using the AVA bracelet and, and trying to figure out their cycle. So what, what are the, you said there were seven factors. Can you kind of go through those? And then what would it look like for, for someone that decided to use this? Like how do they use it? And, and yeah. So I can talk about all, all of the parameters that AVA measures, but one, yeah. one thing I should explain is that um, it's not as simple as saying, okay, these are the seven things and your know, heart rate does this, temperature does this. I think women who are used to tracking their temperature are used to you know, being able to see these really obvious changes on the chart. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's often this impulse to treat your AVA data the same way. But the, the coolest thing about AVA is that it uses a machine learning algorithm. And so because we have so many menstrual cycles in our database, we're able to um, let's see if I can explain how this, this machine learning algorithm works because this is not my area of specialty, but I do understand it somewhat. Um, so it, we, it's called kind of a, it's a black box. You give the algorithm all of this data and then it, it creates a solution that even the people who created the algorithm don't necessarily understand. Um, but this is how a lot of artificial intelligence works and um, you know, it's used in all kinds of healthcare and other applications and it's really cool. So with that caveat said, um, I can explain all the different things that Ava measures. There's your, your temperature, which um, I think a lot of your listeners are probably already familiar with. Temperature um, increases after ovulation. The reason why it does is because after ovulation, your progesterone levels increase and that causes your metabolism to go up. And when your metabolism goes up, your body is literally burning more energy and that creates heat. And that's why you can see this, you know, half a degree rise in your temperature. Ava measures that. That's, I think the, the really innovative thing of what Ava does there isn't that's a new parameter. It's that it's a much easier way to get that data than taking your temperature every morning. Then there's resting pulse rate which I just explained. There's breathing rate. Typical, typically, your breathing rate during sleep is between 10 and 25 beats per minute, um, but it also changes in a significant way during your cycle. It's higher in your luteal phase than in your follicular phase. There's heart rate variability, um, which I explained. There's perfusion. And so perfusion is the process of supplying blood to the, tissue, the different tissues of your body. Um, and one way to explain what this is that's... Um, it's very tangible is if you've ever like had a rubber band tied around your finger and you felt the blood flow being cut off, um, that's then you're familiar with the process of perfusion. Um, so tying a band around your finger limits perfusion, but you can also, perfusion also changes naturally for different reasons. Um, it can change to um, keep you cool or warm, help you warm up. Um, and it changes in your menstrual cycle. It's lower at the beginning of your fertile window and higher in your luteal phase. Um, it also measures, Ava also measures movement with an accelerometer. Uh, and this is one of the main ways that we're able to distinguish between the different phases of your sleep. And then the last thing it measures is your sleep. Yeah. So, okay. So temperature, rest, the breathing rate, the HRV, the perfusion, um, movement, and then sleep. And so, and so someone that was trying to get pregnant using the bracelet, then how would they, what is the data? Like, what do they get for when, I guess, to, for, um, 
information, I guess. Yeah, good question. Um, so you you put on Ava when you go to bed. You wear it during your sleep. Take it off. Sync it with your phone in the morning. In about 30 seconds, all of that data that was collected continuously throughout the whole night um, is uploaded into, it goes into the algorithm, and then you, you see a chart that, that shows, um, so like when you first start using AVO, it'll say, okay, based on, you know, the history of your, how long your cycle is, this is when you're, this is when you're predicted to have your ovulation and your fertile window. But then as it gets this data every day of your cycle and you sync, the algorithm updates it and it says, oh, okay, well, you're not a machine. You're different every month and you're not, you're different than the average. So based on what we saw that was happening inside of your body last night, this is, you know, now we're going to say, actually, your fertile window looks like it's a day earlier because we see these signs that it's opening or it's a little later. Um, and I think that's so important because there's this interesting study that says 70% of women their fertile window does not fall entirely within the um, within the parameters that you know the textbook uh, average cycle should. And then um, I forget what percent, but like I think it's like fifty percent of women their fertile window can vary by up to a week from cycle to cycle. And so this idea that you can you know if you're using a period tracker app to track your cycle and just looking at the length, the dates of your period can tell you when your fertile window is. That is is so wrong. Um, you know, your your luteal phase is uh, might not like that can range anywhere from like you know under ten days to sixteen plus days. Your fertile your sorry your follicular phase can be it can be different from cycle to cycle. It's impacted by things like stress, sleep, um, things that we probably just don't even understand. And so having a um, a, a method of tracking your cycle that's actually alerts to the to the things changing in your body on a day-to-day -day basis is really crucial if you want to be precise in catching your fertile days because there's really only, um, let's see, there's like two to three days that, you know, are your highest chances of getting pregnant. And so if you're using a period tracking app and it's off by two days or so, that's, that's not that bad for, you know, that's, that's pretty close, but you could miss your entire most fertile days. So yeah, we have a lot of our clients that are using using the AVA tracker and they and they like it. Anything else you'd like to share about um, for fertility? Kind of what's obviously they're getting the data, and then anything else that you wanted to share there? Um, one more thing I want to share is about the AVA communities. Um, so I think a lot of people don't realize this until after they start using AVA, but we have these um, private closed Facebook groups for all of our, um, AVA users and they're, you know, for different topics and different languages. And they're these really, really wonderful, intimate places where you can go to, you know, make, ask questions about what's going on in your chart, um, meet other people, talk about just the emotional ups and downs of trying to conceive. And I think that the, that that kind of knowledge and community support piece is so big. Um, that really was super helpful to me when I was trying to conceive. I had never been someone who thought like online, I thought online communities were like weird and I wasn't super into them. But then I don't know how I would have gotten through the whole fertility and pregnancy journey without that. Um, so, and, and there's women who, you know, meet in real life and are friends. And so I just want to share that that's that's also a part of Ava, and people often don't realize that. I, I see it's won a, a femtech award, which is kind of a neat little <laughs> little uh, the femtech uh, industry. I guess is alive and well. Um, yes, I'm glad that, that there's a name for it because <laughs> there's so many cool companies in the space. Yeah, and so it won, what wanted to win the award for then? Um, I don't even remember. Let me see. I can. Sorry, I'm I'm, I'm sad that I don't remember exactly what it was for, but probably for being. Awesome and innovative in yeah. in femtech products. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And so, is there a? Um, a we'll, we'll obviously link to Ava, but is there a, a book or a website or an app or a documentary, anything that uh, you're obsessed with right now? You'd like to recommend that you're loving? Um, yeah, there's a few. Um, so, I mean, the first one is is Ava World, the, the website that I mentioned at the beginning that I run. Um, that's, just, I think there's, there's, if you're Googling information about fertility or the menstrual cycle, there's a lot of big websites like WebMD or Healthline that kind of talk about every health topic under the sun. And I see that when they cover women's health and fertility issues, they'll, they'll often just give you this like 
high level, not like really nerdy deep dive overview, and even sometimes repeat misconceptions. And um, Ava World is the place where the people who are you know obsessed with getting to the very bottom of every topic are, and you know, linking all of the studies that you'll find all that kind of information there. So Excellent. Ava World is a great resource. That's it. Just at avawomen.com slash Ava World. Another really cool. Um, two other really cool ones. One is, this is actually in Canada. It's called SEMCOR, I think. It's C-E-M-C-O-R. And it's, it's part of UBC, I think. But it's, it's just an institute that's um, solely focused on menstrual cycle research and, you know, and the importance of ovulation. And their big thing is, oh, estrogen gets too much, too much attention, but progesterone is so important. And they, I, what I think one of the most understudied areas of women's health and fertility is progesterone in the luteal phase. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you, if you have a short luteal phase and you're worried that's preventing you from getting pregnant and you go to your doctor, chances are they're going to be like, ah, oh, there's really no evidence for this. There's not, and that's true. There isn't enough evidence. And you know, it's, it's, you might not have a great experience getting support for that. And so this is, but there, there's reason to believe that's an important factor in fertility. And so this is a organization that is looking into that, doing research studies and has a lot of just like really interesting content articles on their site. And then the last one that I want to recommend is the period podcast. Um, it's just called period podcast and they, it's a pretty small and not super well-known podcast, I think, but they just do a really, really good job of, talking about um, the anyone who just wants to nerd out about hormones. They're, they're very detailed and accurate and thorough, and I enjoy them a lot. Awesome. I haven't heard that one. Okay. Yeah. And so um, uh, SEMCOR, so C-E-M-C-O-R, that's UBC, so Uni University of British Columbia, uh, doing digging into the uh, menstrual cycle. So that's awesome. Uh, yeah, we, we also use the Dutch test with our our clients to really, instead of just focusing on the blood, looking at the urine, and you can see exactly where the different pathways and the hormones are going down, because a lot of times people will come in with a specific um, diagnosis, and actually their hormones don't reflect that diagnosis. So it's interesting to, to see exactly, you know, looking at the your the, the sex hormones, your melatonin, your cortisol, sort of all, all those connecting, and the period podcast, I haven't heard that one, so awesome, thank you. Is there a success story you'd like to share with us? I'm sure you've had lots from Ava. Yes. You had the first Ava baby I saw there. <laughs> Um, yeah, there, there definitely is a success story. So I, I wanted to pick one to share that was specifically related to postpartum cycle yeah. tracking. Yeah. Um, so we have, um, we have, but, but on any topic, I could share lots of different success stories. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, so th there was an Ava user or she's still a user, Rachel, um, H Hassley. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing her name right, but, um, she started wearing Ava to get pregnant with her first. Um, she took a break from wearing it when she was immediately postpartum because, um, she didn't have her cycle back yet and she was breastfeeding and just not getting very much sleep. But she really, she came from a family that the kids were spaced really close together and she kind of wanted the same thing. Um, so she stopped breastfeeding at 15 weeks postpartum, started wearing Ava right after she stopped, even though she hadn't gotten her period back yet. And initially it was just one kind of long cycle. It wasn't really clear what was happening. She finally got her period, um, and immediately after that, she saw in her AVA data that her cycle looked exactly the same as it did in her pre-pregnancy cycle. She could just look and compare the charts, and it looked like they were exactly the same, and it looked like that was what was normal for her. And she knew that this was you know, likely a normal, healthy ovulatory cycle because it had the same pattern as it did before. That said, a lot of women have just their cycles change postpartum, and they're still ovulatory, but she was like, oh, this is a good sign. It looks normal. Um, so, um, and, and her ovulation day was the same as it was uh, before she got pregnant. And she had a really easy experience getting pregnant for her, her second. Um, it was on her third cycle. And she's now due in February. And her first will be 14 months when her second arrives, which kind of like, just to think about that gives me anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's what she wanted. And I think that's wonderful. <laughs> Good for her. <laughs> and then anything for, um, and a story around um, fertility, if someone was struggling with infertility that. Uh... Yeah, definitely. So um, here's this one. I don't have like one individual person because this is a story I, I hear so, so often, mm -hmm. but there's, there's been so many women who they've, they've been struggling to get pregnant. They've been trying for a long time. And I think there's a combination of they maybe have subfertility of some kind and they're trying at the wrong time um, by over-reliance on OPKs. What I hear again and again is I started using Ava. Ava told me I should try earlier in my cycle or later in my cycle. It tends to be earlier, um, 
But in, in my case, like I, I, Ava told me to try later than all the other things were telling me, and that was right for me. But I think like for a small major, majority of women, it's it's Ava tells them to try earlier. Um, so they do that, um, and then they get pregnant. And initially, they're very skeptical. They're like, okay, why is Ava, you know, contradicting what these OPKs are telling me about when I ovulate? Yeah, as I was talking about before, sometimes o- OPKs can can cause you to miss out on when you're really most fertile. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love that. Okay. And so you have a, um, a special discount here for the listeners uh, when they go to avawomen.com and um, in the checkout, they can enter in naturally and they can get $20 off Ava. So can you just maybe just explain that a little bit or? Yeah. So um, you just go to avawomen.com. The, um, the order Ava button is um, very prominent and green and click on that. And as you're going through the checkout process, it, it's really um, there's a place where you can put in a promo code and um, that will give you $20 off. Yeah. And so the, really the Ava bracelet, you're just wearing it at, at, at night. Yes. Only at night. A lot of women think I that. Because I went, when I first saw it, I'm like, oh, because it's, you know, it's, it's okay, but it, it's, it's. Yeah, I mean, you really don't want people being like, what is that bracelet? Yeah, and you're like, that's... oh, that's because I have infertility and I'm trying to get pregnant <laughs> and it's really stressful and this tells me when I'm fertile and actually I need to go home and have sex. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. And also sometimes women are asked like, well, if I want it to be really, really accurate, should I wear it all day? No, because your physiological parameters are at their baseline at night. And so it wouldn't help and it would actually, it, yeah, it wouldn't help at all to wear it during the day because then your heart rate and your breathing rate is all impacted by your daily activities, not by just your hormones. I think someone described this as the Fitbit for your period. Yeah, Fitbit for your period, for your uterus, for your fertility. <laughs> for lots of Fitbit comparisons. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Well, great. Well, thanks for, for coming on the uh, podcast here, sharing your words of wisdom around around this topic. I love it. And definitely for everyone to check out the Ava bracelet if it feels right for you. And yeah, thanks again, Lindsay. Hey there, I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the supercharger fertility discovery call is for action takers really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B, fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B, fertile.com and click on book a free call. The Get Pregnant Naturally podcast, including show notes and links, provides information with respect to healthy living, nutrition, lab testing, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.